I can find it. Well, I guess it disappeared. The, um, there will be a congregational meeting on July the 23rd, not the 22nd. After the service, there's no service on the 22nd. We're not Seventh-day Adventists, so we will meet on Sunday. The 23rd after church, there will be a brief congregational meeting, just an update kind of thing, so it's not a, we're not voting on anything or changing the bylaws or the doctrinal statement or firing the past or anything like that. Uh, also, one other thing, for those of you who have been watching the slides, some of you were so busy looking at the, at the faces you didn't catch that the Dome of the Rock is removed and the temple has been inserted, things as it ought to be. Of course, everybody who um, went on the trip is glad that we went in the middle of June instead of the middle of July. So we need to be in prayer for what's going on. Every time things like this happen, I'm just convinced that the Lord is just moving the pieces on the chessboard a little more, and things get closer and closer, which is good because we're studying the doctrine of the imminency of the coming of Christ on Sunday morning. So I always like it when the things that we teach are close to what's going on in the headlines. It makes it seem a little more relevant. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, let's have a few moments of silent prayer. We need to make sure that we are in fellowship, so the... Lord has provided us with the gracious provision of confession of sin, not based on what we are, what we do, how we feel, but on the finished work of Christ on the cross. But, you know, we always have to be reminded that it's not about just getting forgiveness for sins. It's about abiding in Christ, which takes it to the next level, which is, mean, means that it's not just about confessing. It's about staying in fellowship, and that means dealing with, with letting through the word of God and the spirit of God dealing with the sin in our life. Let's bow our heads. I'll open in prayer after a few moments of silent prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word this evening. We thank you that you have provided everything for us on the cross through the complete substitutionary a death of Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty for our sins. There's nothing we can do to add to it. There's nothing we can do that take away from it. His work is complete, sufficient, and all that is required of us is to trust in, in him. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us at the instant of salvation, the positional cleansing of our sin, the identification with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and all that you provide for us through the uh, work of God the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, as we continue our study in Hebrews 6 this evening, we pray that you would help us to understand the doctrine of baptism and its significance for us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Hebrews chapter 6. Just pick up the context, Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary, we saw last time that has the idea of foundational principles about Christ. Arche is the word there, and it ties in and is a synonym for the word stoicheia used back in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, talking about basic doctrines about or related to the person of Christ. So what follows here is going to be related to, uh, excuse me a minute while I correct a, some kind of glitch here on my computer or it keeps trying to get on the internet. There, that ought to do it. Okay. 
Therefore, leaving the discussion of the foundational principles about Christ, let us go on to maturity. And then we have the uh, characteristics of these foundational doctrines. The first we studied last time, the time before, the foundation of repentance, that is changing your mind from thinking that works has some value toward God and instead trust in God, the juxtaposition of works of legalism versus faith in God. We saw then uh, verse 2, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. What we're focusing on is an understanding of this doctrine related to baptisms. And one of the first things we addressed was the issue of the verbiage that is used here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. You have the word here of uh, baptismos, which denotes the act as a fact. There's a different word here than what we might expect. There's two different forms of this word in the Greek. One ends with the uh, suffix mos, the other ends with the suffix ma. And mos, which is the word we have here, is usually used for the ceremonial washing of the Jews, in contrast to the word baptisma, which is the word that is usually uh, descriptive of Christian baptism, Jesus baptism, or the baptism of John the Baptist. Now, the unusual thing about this word is that here it occurs in the plural. That's extremely rare. I believe the writer chose this word because it encap- the, the plural encapsulates both ideas, both the Jewish ritual washing idea and what it was uh, what it pictured as pictured in the baptism of John Jesus or believers' baptism. They all relate to pictures of related to cleansing in terms of ritual baptism. That's the foundation. So he uses the word in the plural because it ties together both of these ideas. He's addressing Jew, former Jewish priests who are now believers who are uh, on the verge of throwing away their Christianity, going back into Judaism. And so he's saying we don't want to lay again this, this basic doctrine related to understanding the significance of these rituals in Judaism, what they portrayed, as well as the uh, Christian rituals related to John's baptism, Jesus' baptism, or believers' baptism. So that brought us to an introduction to the whole doctrine of baptism last time. And I gave you two points to begin with last time, which basically define things and then set up the different kinds of baptisms. There are eight different baptisms. Well, we start with the definition that baptism comes from the Greek word verb baptizo, or the actually the English verb baptize, comes from the Greek verb baptizo, which means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. As an action, it signifies identification of someone with an action, with a person, with an object, or with a new status in life. Identification is its significance. And then I went to the second point to talk about the different kinds of baptisms. There are three ritual baptisms, which all involve water, and they are the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3, 13 to 17, the baptism of John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 1 to 11, and the baptism of church-age believers, Acts 2, 38, 2, 41, Acts 8, 36 to 38. We'll come back and talk about the significance, especially of the believer's baptism uh, at the end, I want to deal with the uh, dry baptisms first. The, as we looked at that, I also pointed out that there were four elements in ritual baptism that are important to understand. The first is that there is a person who performs the baptism. The word we're going to use here is the agent of the baptism. The agent of the baptism. Now, the reason we do that is because we, we, we get into some interesting Uh, exegesis because in some passages you shift from an active voice verb where the subject performs the action to a passive voice verb of baptism where the subject receives the action. So rather than becoming confused with this concept of who's the grammatical subject of the sentence, we want to talk about proper terminology, 
the agent. This is the one who performs the action, whether it's a passive voice verb or an active voice verb. So just keep that in mind. We may not get there uh, fully tonight, but in the sentence, John hit the ball, John is not only the grammatical subject of the verb hit, he's also the agent who performs the action of the verb. If you make it a passive voice construction, the ball was hit by John, John is no longer the subject of the verb. The ball is now the subject of a passive voice verb, but John is still the agent who performs the action. Okay? That's what we're going to talk. That's why we use this terminology. Okay, now that's going to become important because that has not always been clear in grammatical discussions of the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. And so people have gotten confused over this, and you actually have ended up with two different baptisms by the Holy Spirit, and you didn't know it. So, second, the element which provides the identification. So you have the agent who performs the action. John performs the action. The Holy Spirit is, the, is not the one who performs the action, though. So we have to understand that. Then, then there's an element. The element may be water, can the Spirit, fire. Uh, these are uh, different instances. Then you have the person identified. That is, who is being identified in the passage? In the baptism by, with Moses, the Jews in the Old Testament coming out of slavery in Egypt are the ones identified. And with John's baptism, it is the Jew who is repenting for the coming of the kingdom. So we have to look at the person identified. And then there is a new status into which the person is entered. So those are the elements, and we have to keep these elements in mind as we analyze uh, the doctrine of baptism. You always find these things present, even in uh, dry baptism. So uh, they're not only present in ritual baptism, but also dry baptism. All right, all of that we've covered in the past, just review. Then we came to come to our five real baptisms. Five real baptisms are all dry baptisms. These are the baptism of Noah. We'll take them in chronological order. I'm going to list them, and then we'll come back and talk about each one. The baptism of Noah, 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. Second, the baptism of Moses, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. Third, the baptism of fire, mentioned in Matthew 3, 11 to 12. Fourth, the baptism of the cross. And fifth, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you scripture for those when we get there. Okay, these are the five dry baptisms. Let's talk about this first one. This is really interesting because... At first glance, you don't see this when you look at this passage, so that's one reason I always enjoy teaching 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. 1 Peter 3, 20 reads, "...who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah." The who here is referring to the spirits in prison. This is the fallen angels who committed the sin with the uh, daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6. That's the previous verse. Uh, this is the context here is talking about how Jesus went down to uh, preach to the spirits in prison who once were disobedient, and then it tells us when this occurred, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now they went through the water. They were not in the water. The ones who got wet died. The ones who stayed dry were the ones who go through the baptism. That's why it's a dry baptism. 1 Peter 3.21, And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Now, you didn't know that, did you? That you were saved by baptism. See, this is one of those passages that people will go to to try to prove that you're saved by water baptism, but they just don't read it closely enough. Corresponding to that, Baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh, which immediately tells you he's not talking about water baptism. Remember last week I put up on the, on the screen the picture of all of the ritual baths outside the entrance to the temple in, in uh, Jerusalem in, in the uh, second temple period. There were these mikvot, in the plural, where the person coming to the temple would take a ritual bath, take off his robe, and he would, he would take a dip in the uh, mikvah, 
and then he would come out and he would be ritually cleansed. When we were up in Masada, there were a number of these mikvot. They were obsessed with ritual cleansing and uh, rabbinical Judaism. So Peter uh, rejects that notion here. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I like the way that in the New King James sets off the appositional clause there. Baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the main, that's the main thought. So let's look at this in terms of some basic exegesis. The key phrase that we need to understand is the phrase in verse 21, which all, and, and it's translated in New King James, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Corresponding to what? Okay, it is corresponding to the ark delivering the eight people through the judgment of God at the time of Noah. Now, what we need to understand is this word translated corresponding to. This is a Greek word, antitupon, which means against, corresponding to, or that for which a type refers. Now, look at the breakdown of that word. It is anti tupon. Now, that Greek word tupon, with the U in it, is often transliterated over into English with a Y, which is where we get the English word type. We talk about types in the Bible. Something is a type of Christ. A type is a picture or a shadow of something that will come later, and it is a training aid that God has uh, designed in order to teach spiritual truths or something usually about the person or work of the Lord Jesus Christ. An antitype is that to which the type refers. Let me put a chart up here. Hopefully this will help you understand it a little better. You have types and antitypes. The type is the shadow image. It pictures a future reality. The type, or excuse me, the antitype is the reality. So the antitype corresponds to something that happened earlier. Okay, so something uh, in the present is an antitype that is pictured by something in the past, which is the type. For example, in the Old Testament, you had a lamb without spot or blemish. This is the type. The type is a picture. It pictures something about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it pictures the fact that he was without sin and that he was, in, in judicial terms, totally innocent. He was not just not guilty. We've all run into, seen legal cases in the last few years where People have been declared judicially not guilty. That doesn't mean they're innocent. We all know they're guilty. They just uh, haven't been found legally guilty. But in this case, a lamb is without spot or blemish. It was innocent. And we saw a picture when we were in Israel. They we went to several places that had little films about the destruction of the temple or about how temple worship was conducted. And one of the things that I think struck every one of us as we watched this one film about uh, a man coming to Jerusalem and bringing a lamb to the temple. And here he's walking in, and he's got just this cute little lamb. You just want to pet it and, and cuddle it, and it just it's snowy white, and you're just it just has these, these, these eyes that you could just lose yourself in. And I mean, it just... So, and you realize that's, that's a great picture of Jesus Christ. He was totally without sin. And here you're going to take this sweet, wonderful little baby lamb that hadn't done anything wrong to anybody, and you're just going to slit its throat and splatter blood everywhere. I mean, it's just, you just think about this blood-encrusted altar on the way into the temple, and, it's, and, and the smell of all that blood would be pretty strong, and it's to express the horror of what has to be done to deal with sin. So you have the lamb that is a picture of the antitype, who is Jesus Christ. So we would say Jesus Christ is that which corresponds to or is the antitype of the lamb. You understand what I'm saying? 
Christ is that which corresponds to the Lamb. The Lamb's the type, looks forward to Christ. Christ is the antitype that corresponds back to something. So if, if we just had a question mark there, we didn't have Lamb of God, we just had a question mark of God, and then Jesus is called the Lamb, then we would know that whatever it corresponded to in the back had to be a lamb. That's important for understanding this. See, what we have here is we have something that really isn't... A baptism, the word baptism or baptizo isn't used to refer to what happens with Noah's Ark. But it is used of the antitype. So if the antitype is a baptism, that which the Old Testament shadow image corresponds to is a baptism, then that which occurred in the Old Testament must be a baptism, even though it's not called a baptism. Have I made myself clear? So, since there's the word baptism is not applied to the ark, but it is applied to the antitype, that this is the baptism that now saves us, then the ark and the deliverance from the flood was a baptism. It was an identification. Those eight people that were on the, uh, on the ark were identified with Noah in the same way that later on the Jews who go through the uh, Red Sea are identified with Moses. So it is a baptism. Now let's go back and look at the passage. We read, And corresponding to that... The corresponding, that is the antitype, the, now, the present baptism, corresponds to that, that is the uh, deliverance through the ark. Baptism now delivers you. One question we need to ask here is what baptism is this? The baptism that now delivers us. Well, let's take a look at first, before we identify the baptism, let's look at this word translated now. It's the Greek word noon, which means now, and sometimes it has an immediate rather than a general sense. That is, right now as opposed to this general time period. For example, uh, we often make statements that, um, well, right now Israel is at war. We could say it right out of the headlines today. Right now, Israel's at war. If somebody just heard that sentence in isolation, they might not understand that we're talking about right now today. They might think about generally this time period because off and on, Israel's been fighting terrorists in a war for a long period of time. It's just that today there is a hot war that is happening. That's how Peter is using that in, in a sense. Peter wrote at the beginning of the church age, And the now is referring to now in the church age. Peter personally had heard Jesus announce the coming of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was there on that day that Jesus ascended. And in Acts 1-5, Jesus said, For John truly baptized by means of water, but you shall be baptized by means of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Peter was there when Jesus said the baptism from the Holy Spirit is about to come. This is a unique baptism because it's of its nature for the church age, and it is a dry baptism. Later in Acts chapter 11, Peter declared that this prophecy of Jesus, this announcement that the uh, in Acts 1-5, which was declared that the baptism of the Spirit was yet future, By Acts 11, Peter declared that the prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. In Acts uh, Acts 11, talking to uh, the Gentiles with Cornelius in Caesarea by the sea, he said, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized by means of water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them, that is the uh, um, Gentiles, the same gift as he gave us, that is the Jews, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? So he is reporting uh, to the Jews on what had happened to Cornelius and the Gentiles. The baptism of the Holy Spirit had never occurred 
prior to the day of Pentecost. No baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. This is what distinguishes the church age from the previous dispensations, is every single believer receives at the instant of faith alone in Christ alone this baptism by means of the Holy Spirit, which we'll study in detail before we're done. But what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does is to identify us with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as described in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. That is the that is the baptism that saves us because the instant you put your faith alone in Christ alone, at that instant, many things happen simultaneously. And one of the first things that happens is that the Holy Spirit is used to identify you with Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And that is what I believe Peter is talking about here in First Peter 3.20. 321, that this is the antitype which now saves us, baptism through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, put, I mean, so Peter puts together the type that is the Old Testament um, picture of the ark as a picture of the doctrinal baptism of the Holy Spirit. So both of these are dry baptisms. They don't involve water. The type is Noah's ark. The antitype is the Lord Jesus Christ. The eight who were in the ark, identified with Noah in the ark, are analogous to every single believer in the church age who is in Christ. In the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit, we're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and we are baptized into Christ. We are in Christ. So just as those eight were in the ark, Every believer in the church age is in Christ and thus saved. No judgment came to those who were in the ark. Judgment were on those that were outside of the ark. For church age believers, there is no judgment to us. Romans 8, one. there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Judgment belongs only to unbelievers who are condemned because they sinned? No. Because they did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God, John three, eighteen. So Noah's Ark is a type of this of spirit baptism, which makes it a dry baptism. So that is our our first baptism. The baptism of Noah is a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now as we look at this verse. Let me skip back. The baptism now says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. This is the Greek word ap- apothesis, which means to remove, it's used to remove clothing that is dirty. So it's a physical term. It's not a spiritual term. It's not the washing away of dirt through literal water baptism, but it's an appeal to God for a, a good conscience. And the word there for appeal, for appeal is the Greek word epirotema, which is the word for a pledge. It's the pledge that baptism is a pledge of a good conscience toward God, which comes because we have been cleansed spiritually by God the Holy Spirit at the instant of our faith alone in Christ alone. There is a washing, a cleansing. It is positional cleansing. Now, we have to remember there are two types of cleansing in the Christian life. There is positional cleansing, which takes place at the instant of salvation, which cleanses us from all sin. But then there's experiential cleansing that takes place as we confess our sins as we go through the Christian life. So that even if you die with unconfessed sin, you still go to heaven because you have been positionally cleansed in Christ. I remember when I was a kid, that was a question everybody got concerned about. Well, what if you die with unconfessed sin? What happens? Do you go to hell? Do you have to go to hell for a while? Do you go to purgatory? No. You're positionally cleansed of all sins at the cross, but experientially cleansed through the use of 1 John 1, nine. So this baptism is a focus on positional truth. Now, one other thing I want to note here is that why does he say through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and not through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? And that is because the resurrection 
is the conclusion of this whole process. So he, this is a typical figure of speech where you're talking about an entire, the entire work of Christ on the cross from start to finish. The payment for sins occurs between 12 noon and 3 p.m., but the whole process of his work isn't over with until the resurrection occurs. And so the, the reason he refers to the resurrection here and not the crucifixion is because he's, he's talking about the entire process of the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's included in this process. So he looks at the final element in the work of Christ uh, in saving us. Now, let's go to the next baptism. We looked at the baptism of, of uh, Noah, and now let's go to the next one chronologically, and that's the baptism of Moses. This is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. This is one of those great passages that emphasizes the importance of the Old Testament for believers today. Too many people think, that the Old Testament isn't relevant for church-age believers. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. By fathers here, he's referring to the uh, Jew, Jews of the Exodus generation, not the fathers of the Gentile Corinthians that he's addressing, but he's uh, t referring to just the Jews who came out of Egypt all passed through the sea. Somebody sent me an email the other day that, uh, that if there were two million Jews, that the passing going across the Red Sea would have to be five, the opening would have to be five miles wide in order for all these Jews to get across in one night. Somebody's worked up all the logistics on this, which is pretty fascinating. And I, you know, so there's some things we just don't think about, but they're pretty obvious. Another thing that was pointed out in that email is if the, there are two to three million Jews, which I believe to be true, you had at least 600, uh, I think it was 610,000 uh, men of uh, uh, warrior age between 20, 20 and up. So if you have one child, one woman, and one child for every adult male, then you've got 1.8 million. So it's not difficult to assume 2 million to 2.5 million. Think about it. Houston's not a whole lot larger than that. If you're going to have all those people camp in one spot in the wilderness, that's going to be a campground. Some, it's going to be larger than the circumference of, of Loop 610. It's not going to be quite as far out as a beltway, but it's going to be somewhere in between. That is a huge territory. So the logistics of this were something that only God uh, could accomplish. So they, the, the historical event that is being referred to in 10.1 in is the Exodus event where the Jews pass through the sea on dry ground. Once again, those who are, going, who are getting baptized here stay dry. The ones who get wet are the ones who are judged and the ones who die. And then in verse 2 we read, and all, that is all of these Jews that pass through the sea, were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, the important thing to note here is that the phrase uh, into Moses uses the Greek preposition eith, E-I-S, and that is a directional preposition, and it indicates that this phraseology is used in almost every baptism passage. I'll get to it in a minute. You have the agent who performs the action. You have the verb baptism, either passive or active. Here it would be, it's a passive verb. All were baptized. They received the action of baptism. But does it say who performed the action of baptism in this passage? No, it doesn't. Who's performing the action of baptism in this passage? God. He's not stated, though. See, it's, what you have in all these baptism passages is a formula. You have the agent who performs the work of identification, the verb of identification, the means, which is indicated by the in clause in the Greek, in plus the instrumental, which should be translated by means of the cloud and by means of the sea. Now, the reason that's important is because some people want to take in when you're baptized by water, they want to take that in phrase as 
locative. It can mean locative, location, sphere. But see, if, if these things hold together, what you have here is that the Jews weren't in the cloud, and they weren't in the sea by location. So they're, But they're, the identification with Moses is accomplished by means of the cloud. This is the pillar of cloud indicating the Shekinah presence of God and by means of the sea. So we have to understand this uh, this phrase, instrumentally, it is indicating the instrument God uses to accomplish the identification. The ace clause indicates that new state into which the baptized person is identified. He goes from being what he is now to something new. And so the Jews were identified with Moses and his leadership as they pass through the Red Sea. They're following Moses, they are trusting God, and they are identified with Moses, Moses' faith, and Moses' leadership. So we have the phrase, all Jews, that is, were baptized. God's the one performing the action, identifying them with Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They stayed dry. The army of Pharaoh is judged. Then we have the mention of baptism of fire. This is the third real or dry baptism mentioned in Matthew 3.11. Now, I want you to notice how, by doing it this way, we're building our understanding of the vocabulary and the grammar in these passages. And this is something so crucial and why there's so much confusion over baptism and the different kinds of baptism is because people don't pay attention to the grammar and the technicalities of the passage. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist is speaking. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Now, I didn't put it in here, and we'll cover, cover it again. I'm sort of peeling the onion and peeling the onion and peeling the onion and repeating and repeating because this is important to get. John says, I baptize you with water. That should be by means of water. It's that in clause again. Unto repentance. That's the ace clause. That's the new state, repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Now, in this first sentence, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Who's performing the action of baptism? Who's speaking? I just said it. I want to see. This is a test to see if you all are awake tonight. John the Baptist. Very good. Somebody's alive out there. John the Baptist is performing the action of baptism. He says, I baptize you by means of water into this new state of repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Future active indicative verb. He will baptize you. Who's the he? Christ. Christ is the agent of baptism. He's the subject of the verb here. It's an active voice verb. He's the one who performs the action of this baptism. And there's two baptisms that are talked about here. One by means of the Holy Spirit and one by means of fire. Now notice what John is doing here is he's drawing a, an analogy between what he is doing by means of water and what Jesus will do by means of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me remind you, in, in our exegesis of 1 Corinthians 10, 2, I said it's not in, inside of the sea and inside of the cloud. That doesn't fit because of the, the Jews didn't get into the water, into. So it's not that sense. It is a sense of by means of. So John, it's not talking about John baptizing you in the water. It's talking about that he's using the water to affect the identification. Water is the means. But Jesus is going to come along, and in the future, at some unspecified, undefined future time, he will baptize you two different baptisms, one by means of the Holy Spirit and one by means of fire. Now, just as John is affecting his baptism by means of water, water is simply the instrument, the Holy Spirit is being used by Jesus as an instrument, and fire will be used as the instrument to do something. 
Matthew 3, 12. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So Matthew 3, 12 defines for us the second baptism, that is fire, which is the judgment upon the lost. Their identification with fire and judgment, that is the baptism uh, by means of fire. This takes place uh, at the end of the tribulation. All unbelievers who survive the tribulation will be uh, identified, all unbelievers will be identified with fire. The earth will be judged by Jesus Christ, and then uh, all unbelievers are removed from the earth, identified with the defeat of Satan, and uh, then the millennial kingdom will be established. Now we come to our fourth dry baptism, which is the baptism of the cross. Baptism of the cross is mentioned in Mark ten thirty eight to 39. Once again, we see the main idea is identification. Jesus said to them, that is the disciples, uh, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? They just got through saying, you know, Lord, we'll go through anything with you. And he said, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Are you going to be able to be identified with the same identification that I'm I'm baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, you will be baptized. He's identified on the cross with our sins. That is the essence of the baptism of cross. Jesus Christ is identified with our personal sins, when he was judged for them as our substitute. Now we come to the fourth one, or the fifth one, excuse me. As usual, I can't count. You all know that very well. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Notice how Jesus uses this analogy of drinking With the baptism of the cross, are you able to drink the cup that I am drinking? That's another picture of identification. And that same idea of drinking, of one spirit drinking the cup, is used in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I just want to point out how often these same images go hand in hand through the Scripture. Now, most of you have been taught that In this passage, when it says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized, you have been taught that the Spirit performs the baptism. And you were taught wrong. Why is that? Well, let me go back and and explain it to you. When uh, John announced and prophesied that Jesus would baptize by means of the Holy Spirit, I I really stressed who performs the action of baptism. It's Jesus. He is both the subject of the verb and therefore he is the agent who performs the work of baptism. Now when we come to 1 Corinthians 12, 13 in English, it looks like the Holy Spirit is the agent of that passive verb baptism. See, for by one spirit in numity, we were all baptized, an aorist passive indicative. It looks like the Spirit is is the one who does the the work of baptism because that's how we express this in in um, in English. We when we move from an active voice verb to a passive voice verb in English, we indicate the uh, agent of the ver- of the action of the verb by the preposition by. And so you've probably been taught that the Spirit baptizes you, the Spirit identifies you into Christ. What's the problem? The problem is that John prophesied a baptism that Jesus also prophesied in Acts 1-5 that Jesus would be the agent, the one who performs the baptism by the Spirit. Now, if we come over here and say the Spirit does it, then we've got two baptisms, one performed by Jesus and one performed by the Holy Spirit. Is that what you have? If you say yes, you're charismatic, you're a Pentecostal you got two baptisms. See, that's what charismatic theology says. you got one baptism when you're saved, and then there's a subsequent baptism after you're saved, one by Christ, the other by the Spirit. you got to get them both. This was a problem. Now, now Chafer taught this, and Ryrie taught this, and Walver taught this, and lots of people taught this. In my early years, I taught this. 
And uh, one thing I appreciate, I sat around the library, Mosier Library, with uh, Dan Wallace, who's written a very good grammar on Greek. I disagree with a lot of Dan's theology. But I sat down with Dan one day talking about this in the early 80s, and he walked me through this, and I thought, boy, I talk about a blinding flash of the obvious. Everybody's missed this. So it is a very important thing to understand. Now we go back to Matthew 3.11. John the Baptist said, As for me, I baptize you with water. Notice water is preceded by the preposition in, E-N. You've got to follow these prepositions. But he who is my, uh, he who comes after me is going to do what? Down here at the bottom. He will baptize you with the Spirit in pneumatic. Notice it's the same preposition. So that preposition is instrumental. Now, in, a, in an earlier generation, let's say the Chafer, Walvard, Ryrie generation, there was a huge battle with liberals over the personality of the Holy Spirit. And in grammar, you have something called agency and instrumentality. Unfortunately, theologians of that era confused agency with a person and and uh, instrumentality with a non-personal object. And so if the Holy Spirit is being talked about here, the Holy Spirit's a person, so this has to be agency. And they muddied the waters because agency is a term to describe the subject of the one who performs the action of a passive verb. Are you all thoroughly confused yet? Okay, so you have to, uh, you can't use agent. Agent and instrumentality doesn't have anything to do with whether the thing that is the instrument is a person or non-person. It's a grammatical category. It's not making statements about personhood. So that was a mistake that they made. Acts 1.5, you have the same terminology. John baptized with water in hudity. Hudity is the word for water, by means of water. But you will be baptized in the future by means of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's in pneumity. We keep having this preposition in. First. Corinthians 10, 2, all were baptized into Moses' ace and by means of the cloud and by means of the spirit of the sea. What I'm pointing out again is that this is formulaic. Every time you have baptismal statements, the instrument that's used is indicated by the in preposition. The new state they go into is indicated by an ace preposition. But what you have to pay attention to is whether the verb is passive or active. So we have our English example. John hit the ball with the bat. With the bat indicates the means. The bat is the instrument that's used to hit the ball. So we have John is the subject, hit is the verb, the ball is the object, and the instrument is indicated by the preposition with. All right? Let's add to that. If we switch it and make it a passive verb... The ball was hit by John. Um, The ball was hit by John. The ball by um, by means of the bat. I don't know how that got in there. That's all messed up. The ball was hit by John by means of the bat. The ball shouldn't have been somehow jumped back in there in the second clause. With the bat indicates means. The performer of the action, the ball was hit by John, John was the subject in the active voice construction. Now John is indicated as the performer or the agent of the action with the English preposition by. In Greek, the agent of the passive verb action, the one who performs the action in a passive verb construction, is indicated with the Greek preposition dia or hupa, not in. It's very clear. And we don't have that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. You still have the preposition in. In the prophecy in Matthew 3, 11, John said, the one who comes after me will baptize you in, Greek preposition, in the Spirit. Uh, Jesus said it in Acts 1, 5, the one, the, the whole, you will be baptized not many day, days hence in the Holy Spirit, using the Greek preposition in. Again, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you still have the Holy Spirit as the object of an in clause. You can't all of a sudden now make the object of the in clause the performer of the action of the verb. You just can't do it. So we have to recognize that what we're talking about here is the same thing. 
in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it doesn't state who performs the action, just as it didn't state it in 1 Corinthians 10, 2, when it said that they were all baptized in the water and in the cloud. didn't tell us who. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it doesn't tell us who does the action, who the agent is. It just tells us that it's done by means of the Holy Spirit into the body. The emphasis here in, in the context is the Spirit's the one who performs the action or is used to perform the action into the body. Now, let me try to clarify this a minute by something a little more dramatic. Here's our picture. In the original image, John the Baptist performs the action. He uses water to identify the person with repentance. In this baptism by means of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ uses the Holy Spirit to identify the person with himself in his death, burial, and resurrection. You see how that works? Just as John said, I'm going to use this water to identify you with a new state, Jesus is going to use the Holy Spirit to identify the believer with a new state. What does this picture? It pictures cleansing. Let me take you to one last verse here as we're jumping all over the scripture. In Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us through what? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. These are seen as synonymous categories. The washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is that the Holy Spirit is pictured at like water that completely cleanses us from all sin. See, that's what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 when I started off talking about the baptism of Noah, that that is a picture of the baptism by means of God the Holy Spirit. So we come to other passages on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like Galatians 3, 27 and 28. For all of you who were baptized, that's a passive verb, were baptized, we receive the action of baptism. All of you who were baptized into Christ, that's the new state, the new, our new position. We're in Christ, but here it's talking about the direction of baptism. We're baptized into Christ. We've clothed ourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. See, the, the categories hold up in terms of these prepositions. So at the instant of, of baptism, by means of the Holy Spirit, we enter into union with Christ, and we are in Christ. So, conclusion. The baptism by means of the Holy Spirit is the work of Christ, whereby at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, Christ uses the Holy Spirit in the act of regeneration to identify the believer with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ so that he becomes a new creature in Christ where he is completely cleansed of all sin. Somehow I lost the end of that definition. Where he is completely cleansed of all sin. A baptism by means of the Holy Spirit is the work of Christ whereby at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, Christ uses the Holy Spirit in the act of regeneration to identify the believer with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ so that he becomes a new creature in Christ where he is cleansed of all sin. Now, one last point. When we come to believer's baptism, where the believer is immersed in water, what do you think that is a picture of? It's a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is positional truth. Positional truth is a terribly abstract doctrine. And every time you hear the word positional truth, you go, wait a minute, okay, I think I remember that, right? The identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. 
the Lord has given us these training aids, just like we have the training aids of, of the bread and the cup at the Lord's table, so that when we eat, that is a picture of reception, of faith in Christ, accepting what he has done for us. The bread represents his person. The cup represents his work. We have this, this training aid. We're commanded to do it repeatedly. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But water baptism is different. It pictures a one-time event, which is what happens at positional truth. So next time, we're going to come back and look at those three wet baptisms, look at what they signified, specifically looking at uh, water baptism, believer's baptism, as it is identified by Christ in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 under what is called the Great Commission. And then we're going to work our way through Acts to see how the apostles understood and applied Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Because there have been various confusing things taught by different people. Uh, di different dispensationalists have taught different things about when baptism was effective, when it wasn't. Uh, some uh, hyper-dispensationalists like Bullinger uh, came along and said the church age didn't begin until Acts 28. Others identified Acts 19 or Acts 17, but uh, they all, hyper, these are called hyper-dispensationalists, and they end up saying that are relegating baptism to a transitional period in the early church. It's not for today. So we have to evaluate those arguments and see if they hold water in light of what was going on in the book of Acts. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word this evening and to go through these important doctrines and to understand more fully what was accomplished at our salvation in this work of the Holy Spirit, where the, our Lord uses the Holy Spirit to cleanse us of all sin, to identify us with his own death, burial, and resurrection, that we might be new creatures in Christ. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.